residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital under then chairman, Dr. Franny Moore. His very first job, and I want the trainees in the audience to think about this, his very first job was to be chairman of surgery at the National Cancer Institute at the NIH, a post which he has held since that time and to the current date. Simply stated, he is the father of modern immunotherapy. He described lax cells. He was the first to treat patients with interleukin-2, which led to its FDA approval as the first immunotherapy for patients with metastatic disease. He was the first to treat patients with adoptive T-cell transfer, which has cured, cured hundreds of patients with metastatic disease. He was the first to administer genetically engineered cells to patients. He performed the first clinical trials with checkpoint blockade immunotherapy and was the first to describe autoimmunity as related to response to checkpoint blockade immunotherapy, an incredibly exciting time during which I was very fortunate to be his fellow. He's received just about every accolade that there is to receive within science and medicine. He is the single most cited surgeon in the literature and one of the most uh, cited sur uh, scientists in all of PubMed. He has over 300,000 citations. On a very personal level, he is a man of deep compassion, of deep integrity and incredible drive. He taught me everything there is to know about immunotherapy and he has been a mentor to me personally for over two, almost two decades. A quick allegory, I remember going to my first lab meeting with him with some data on some T cells and he was on the phone and I turned around sheepishly saying, I'll come back later. He said, no, no, Ajay, please sit down. And he got off the phone and said, Everett, I'll call you right back. This is, this is very important. And so that was just Everett Coop. Uh, don't, don't worry about that. For, for the younger people in the audience, I was the Surgeon General at the time. That is the attention that he took to his trainees and to people that were around him and is something that I hope to emulate and I think is just critical for us to continue surgeon scientists in our community. Um, he has remained incredibly involved in my work and all of our work and in our societies. He rarely travels these days, so I'm extremely thankful and honored uh, due to COVID, he will be joining us live over Zoom, uh, but he has put together an amazing uh, presentation for us, and we're deeply indebted. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. Great pleasure to be speaking to you to, uh, this morning. I'd like to talk about efforts in the development of cellular immunotherapy for patients with metastatic solid cancers in area of endeavor now that is being vigorously pursued around the world. I have no personal disclosure. Sadly, I work for the US government and uh, have no uh, disclosures to report. The goal of our work has been to develop effective immunotherapies for patients with metastatic cancer based on the adoptive transfer of immune cells with anti-cancer activity. This is a new approach to immunotherapy in which we use a patient's own immune cells as a drug to attempt to treat the cancer. Now, the advantages of this particular type of immunotherapy that is administering cells from a patient that can attack the cancer are that you can administer very large numbers of cells that are grown in culture. You can grow more than 10 of the 11 quite easily that are highly selected for cells with a high avidity for recognizing tumor antigens. Second, one can potentially identify the exact cell subpopulations and affect their functions that are required for cancer aggression in vivo because you have the cells in a test tube uh, and can therefore study them. And perhaps most importantly, because the immune cells are removed from the body, to attempt to identify cells with anti-tumor activity, one has an opportunity to manipulate and treat the host prior to the cell transfer to provide an altered microenvironment uh, for the transferred cells to be more effective. Now, there are two types of cells that one can use in this kind of uh, approach to immunotherapy. 
First are conventional T cells, T lymphocytes, that are circulating in lymph nodes and other organs that contain T cell receptors, two chains, alpha beta chains that recognize antigens presented by the tumor or antigen presenting cells as small peptides that fit in the groove of a surface uh, matrix compatibility complex molecule. A second approach, more recent, is to use a kind of cell that's a laboratory creation. It's called a chimeric antigen receptor, CAR cell. It takes the heavy and light chains of an antibody that can recognize something on a cancer, connect it to signaling chains and insert it into a lymphocyte that gives the lymphocytes the recognition capacity of an antibody and not its conventional T cell receptor. This is a laboratory creation uh, that was first developed by uh, uh, Zelik Geshar and Gideon Gross in Israel a little over 10 years ago. I mentioned these chimeric antigen receptor T cells because this is the first cell therapy and gene therapy that's ever been approved by the Food and Drug Administration uh, for the treatment of, uh, of cancer. And I'll just present this very briefly. It's a treatment for patients with lymphomas and leukemias. And the first patient uh, ever treated was one that we treated uh, at the National Cancer Institute in 2009, published it in 2010. A 48 year old gentleman that had an aggressive lymphoma. He'd been through multiple cycles of chemotherapy, a vaccine, uh, checkpoint modulator therapy, more aggressive chemotherapy, had extensive disease uh, that was uh, progressing. Came to us for treatment with his own T cells that had been genetically modified to recognize an antigen that's present on B cell lymphomas and leukemia. It's called CD19. He had a massive tumor burden, as you can see in his chest, uh, these big mediastinal lesions, spleen, large lymph nodes surrounding his aorta vena cava, large iliac lymph nodes, was treated with his own cell, was genetically modified to target CD19 on these tumors, and he's undergone a complete regression, now ongoing over 11 years later. Bone marrow was replaced by lymphoma. It cleared completely. But the price that one paid is that normal B cells, which express this antigen, were all eliminated, pointing out it's just as easy to kill a normal cell as a tumor cell. And they remained away for about six or seven months before they recovered in the patient, even though normal T cells, the natural killer cells, recovered uh, in a normal, uh, normal fashion. Well, the surgery branch went on to perform a study showing in patients with the most aggressive lymphoma, diffuse uh, large B-cell lymphomas, that one could get complete durable responses in almost half of patients. Uh, the uh, biopharmaceutical company quickly caught up with this. In 2012, the surgery branch signed a crater with a new biotech startup, a startup started by Ari Belligran, one of our former fellows called Kite Pharma, we signed the Cooperative Research Agreement in 2012. This treatment then following clinical trials by us and Kite uh, in 2017, Kite received FDA approval uh, to offer this treatment worldwide. And in October 2017, five years after the founding of Kite, the company was sold to Gilead Biosciences for $11.9 billion and this treatment is now available uh, around the world. Uh, and I mention it because it uh, demonstrates that one can use cells for effective therapy uh, in approved treatments by, uh, now by the FDA uh, that involve genetic modification of cells. Well, if we look at the overall problem with cancer in the United States, there are over a million six hundred thousand cases, about six hundred thousand deaths. It's the solid epithelial cancers that account for ninety percent of all cancer deaths in the United States, only 10% from the hematologic cancers. And that is the major challenge that confronts all therapy, certainly cancer immunotherapy today, and that is the development of effective immunotherapies for patients with metastatic epithelial solid cancers, the kind of cancers that we as surgeons deal with every day, that cannot be cured by any available treatment and result in 90% of cancer deaths the metastatic epithelial cancers that we need to develop more effective treatments for. 
Well, our studies began in patients with metastatic melanoma. We treated 194 consecutive patients with their own lymphocytes that were isolated from growing tumors. We call these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but they were placed to look for a cell doing battle against the cancer than within the cancer stroma itself. And you can see by isolating these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, growing them to large amounts outside the body and then readministering them, you can see that rhesus responses, 55% of all patients, Patients would show objective rhesus responses with a quarter of patients having complete durable regressions. And notice here in these 46 patients that had in our hands complete durable regressions, only two have ever gone on uh, to recur. The other 44 uh, remain in complete regression. It requires just a single treatment. It's a living treatment. The cell can expand a thousand fold in the first 10 days after their infusion as they patrol the body, uh, find tumor stop at that location, extravasate, uh, expand at the local site, and that's an immune reaction that can result in destruction uh, of, the, of the cancer. And thus it appears in patients with melanoma that adoptive cell therapy appears to able to eliminate the last melanoma cell. As you can see, uh, we're out here beyond, well beyond 10 years, uh, and now with further follow-up beyond 20 years, uh, appears to be a curative treatment for patients with melanoma, and about 35% of patients with metastatic melanoma go on to survive long term. Well, this work led us into the study of uh, epithelial cancers by enabling, enabling us to ask what did the TIL actually recognize that results in the in vivo destruction of the last melanoma cell? And we were led to look at cancer mutations because we were seeing specific cancer regression in the absence of any uh, off-tumor on-target toxicities. And that led us to explore the very basic difference between tumor cells and normal cells, and that is the accumulation of mutations that actually result uh, in the origins and progression of, uh, of cancer. These are the most specific differences between cancers and normal cells. That led us to develop an assay to try to determine what it was on these solid epithelial cancers that we might target. And again, I need to just remind the group that T cells recognize targets based on a T cell receptor that recognizes a small process peptide that has to fit onto the groove of a patient's own MHC molecule. And that's true for CD8 cells and for CD4 cells. And because that receptor has to recognize this peptide, it has to be processed by the cell. Uh, if we look at all of the mutations in the cancer, only very few of them will have the characteristics that enable them to be recognized by the immune system. When we developed this assay for determining the nature of cancer antigens, what is it that people recognize on their cancer as part of an immune reaction? And to do that, we isolate genomic DNA and RNA, we do whole exome sequencing uh, and transcriptome sequencing that can now be done very readily in our own laboratory. Uh, it took 10 years and $2 billion to sequence a human genome. We can now do whole exome sequencing on a tumor in normal cells in 10 or 11 days with all the bioinformatics by two weeks, know every mutation that exists in that, uh, in that cancer. We then take every mutation, generally an amino acid, a non-synonymous mutation, an amino acid that's mutated, and make 25 more peptides that we then put into a patient's own antigen presenting cell that contains all of the MHC molecules of that patient. And then by doing a co-culture with lymphocytes that mediated complete regression, we can look to see whether any of those mutated products are actually recognized by the cancer. And so again, it's this 25 more with an amino acid mutation in the middle that has to be included in every nine to 11 more uh, that encompasses that mutation. There's no need to do any uh, peptide predictions to MHC molecules, all candidate peptides, and all MHC loci are included in the screen, and there's no tumor cell line uh, necessary. Well, we utilize this assay to identify the antigens in 76 consecutive melanoma patients to determine which are the reactivities responsible to their anti-tumor activity. 
median of over 300 mutations per tumor at 44,000 mutations. We screened the ones that were expressed, 13,000. That resulted in 180 different antigens recognized by these 76 patients. About 1.3% of mutations were immunogenic. They were almost all recognized by CD8 cells. And the big surprise is that every patient recognized a different antigen. All the neoantigens were unique recognition of mutated products. None were shared among, among patients. Well, that then led us to do this in 130 consecutive patients with a variety of gastrointestinal cancers. There were 20,000 different mutations in those 130 patients. We screened 15,000 that were expressed, identified 210 immunogenic molecules that were the antigens recognized equally by CD8 and CD4 cells. And once again, every patient was recognizing a unique antigen, except for two patients that recognize the same KRAS mutation restricted by uh, an unusual class one molecule CW0802. Breast cancer was the same, 43 patients. We identified 100 immunogenic uh, epitopes. About 2% of all the mutations were recognized. Again, in this situation, almost all recognized by CD4 cells, and again, all were unique to the patient uh, who had that particular cancer. But this is our total study as of now, 195 patients. Notice that about 80% of all cancer histologies uh, give rise to T cells that can recognize tumor antigens. A total of 363 different neoantigens recognized, all unique, except for these two KRAS antigens. And so it's not that some tumors are immunogenic and others not. It looks like across the board, for most tumor histologies, there are T cell reactivities present. It appears as if about 80% of all cancers are immunogenic and we're getting better at being able to uh, identify them. But an advantage of targeting mutations is its applicability to target multiple cancer types because cancers are caused by the accumulation of mutations. And therefore, this is not restricted to just one type of cancer. And let me show you some examples of this before I present a summary. Uh, the first patient, interestingly, was a patient with a cholangial carcinoma of interest to this group particularly. Uh, she had a, a hepatectomy, developed metastases, chemotherapy didn't respond, more chemotherapy didn't respond. We gave her unselected TIL cells, exactly as we did in melanoma, but that only works in patients with melanoma and not in the other solid tumors. We gave her these unselected cells, she progressed. We then developed the technique to select the cells that would recognize her unique antigen, which was her B2IP, one of 26 mutations. We identified cells that could uniquely recognize this, about 95% of the cells could recognize her B2IP. And the patient had a complete progression. Actually, all the two lesions disappeared. You can see these progressive lung lesions. She had three liver lesions. Two did not disappear. We took them out, uh, and the patient now remains disease-free as of the present time, almost eight years after her, uh, after her treatment. There's a patient with metastatic breast cancer, and I present this to show the variety of cancers that can be treated. She had an invasive breast cancer, ERPR positive, went through seven treatments, progressed through them all, came to the surgery branch for treatment. We identified four different antigens that appear to be random somatic mutations, not driver genes that we could target. We targeted them and the patient underwent a complete regression, this tumor uh, growing through the chest wall, multiple liver metastases. Uh, she was treated just six years ago and remains in a complete uh, regression of her, uh, of her cancer. The patient with cervical cancer, again, to illustrate multiple histologies who had an aggressive fungating cervical, uh, cervical mass, uh, developed lung and intraperitoneal metastases, underwent radiation therapy, developed widespread disease, came to us uh, for a treatment. You can see these intra-abdominal lymph nodes, it's chest wall disease, more disease, this node blocking her ureter, we put in a catheter. Uh, she underwent a complete regression and remains now completely disease-free uh, over six years later. Finally, a patient with colorectal cancer, as you can see, uh, quite aggressive, uh, invading the bladder, had multiple lung metastatic deposits, needed radiation of her bladder suture line, 
uh, she had seven lung metastases that were uh, that were growing. We identified cells that could recognize an antigen in her tumor. This was a KRAS antigen. Of these seven metastatic deposits, six went on to completely disappear, but one grew. We took that lesion out, and as we looked at the copy numbers for this particular chromosome, chromosome six, one copy of chromosome six was lost as this tumor grew. Chromosome six encodes the MHC antigens that these immunogenic peptides can be presented on. It was loss of that allele that prevented that lesion from being uh, of, uh, undergoing regression. We took it out and she remains disease free now over five years later. Well, this is where we stand in a series of three pilot studies. Uh, if one uses bulk till in the solid epithelial cancers, you get no responses. If you can select the till, where when we were getting resist responses of about 12%. But because we know these cells can express checkpoint modul modulators once they're injected, if we give the cells with pembrolizumab, we can uh, now get almost a quarter of these uh, solid tumor patients responding. And so the two hypotheses come from this work. First, that it's the recognition of random somatic mutations that's the final common pathway that explains cancer regression for most, if not all, immunotherapies for the solid cancers. It's true for IL-2, anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1, uh, and as you've seen, for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. The second is that any intracellular protein can potentially be a cancer antigen if it's mutated in a process intracellularly to a peptide that could bind to the autologous MHC molecule of that patient. Now, this is good news and bad news. The good news is because all cancers have mutations, if we're attacking them, then all cancer patients are potentially eligible if this approach can be developed. But the bad news is that the treatment will have to be highly individualized. It's a living treatment using a patient's own cells that target unique antigens in that patient. And thus it's likely to be complex. But as you saw from the development of CAR T cells, if something works well, the genius of modern industry will figure out ways to deliver it to patients. Well, we've talked about unique somatic mutations in intracellular proteins. There are, however, some driver oncogenes that uh, have mutations that can be recognized. We've talked about KRAS is also P53 to develop more off the shelf type reagents to target cancer. And so we've developed a library of T-cell receptors that can recognize KRAS mutations on a variety of different MHC molecules. This is uh, one of the most highly mutated genes in human cancer. It's about 30% of all cancers have KRAS mutations. About 90% of pancreatic cancers have them. There are some hotspots that can be targeted. And we've developed a long library of these T-cell receptors. None of this has been published yet. Uh, this is a paper that's been accepted uh, uh, for publication that can recognize KRAS in a variety of different uh, patients that have different MHC molecules. It's also true uh, for uh, patients with, with the, that have CD8 T cell reactivity. And you can see about 33% of all patients might be eligible for treatment uh, that have KRAS mutations if these receptors can be made to, uh, to work. We're also raising libraries of T cell, T cell receptors that can recognize P53 mutations in human cancers. The most common mutation, 50% of all cancers contain P53 mutations. And using a variety of techniques, we've been raising T cells to generate reactivities against these mutations that tend to occur in hotspots in the DNA binding domain of this molecule. And with this library of T cell receptors, we can potentially treat about five and a half percent of patients uh, that have these particular MHC restriction uh, elements uh, in, their, uh, in their cancer. We've only begun to do this and have only treated one patient thus far with their own cells that have been transduced with an anti-P53 receptor. She had a wonderful response that lasted a little over six months before she progressed. You can see she had had multiple treatments beforehand, 
uh, extensive disease in her pericardium right before we began treating her. Uh, and she underwent a regression of all visible and evaluable diseases you can see here in her skin. She had a big effusion, a lot of biopsy proven tumor in her pericardium. Uh, and she underwent a regression lasting six months before she then recurred with some uh, subcutaneous nodules. You can see she had a tumor almost completely replacing her breast, uh, all, of which, uh, all of which disappeared. And so we're enthusiastic about this approach using off-the-shelf reagents to try to treat man, uh, patients with cancer. Well, what I've tried to uh, very briefly demonstrate is the application of this new approach to immunotherapy, cell transfer therapy, which can mediate durable regressions in patients with metastatic cancer refractory to other treatments. The T cells that recognize unique somatic mutations can be found in TIL and peripheral blood in patients with common epithelial cancers. And finally, that the identification and targeting of mutations unique to each cancer or shared mutations such as KRAS or P53 have the potential to extend the cell uh, immunotherapy to patients with common epithelial cancers using either naturally occurring or T cell receptor transduced cells. Well, thank you for your very kind attention. Oh, John. This is a fascinating work. Do we have Dr. Rosenberg available? I am. There he is. Dr. Rosenberg, thank you so much for uh, putting together this absolutely amazing and inspirational review. And not just a review, but showing us what the future is gonna look like. And for those of us in the room that manage complex liver and pancreatic cancers, you've shown us some data that this strategy can be used for just about any solid tumor malignancy, even when there are rare antigens. I was hoping you could comment on how we can use it specifically in those malignancies like you showed for clangiocarcinoma, where those mutations may be very patient unique and hard to find. And then we'd like to open the floor to questions if anybody has any. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and especially a pleasure when uh, Ajay Maker contacted me about giving this talk. Ajay was one of our very best fellows in the over three decades that I've been here at the NIH. And I remember well your work, Ajay, with the anti-CTLA-4 as checkpoint modulators were just coming into, uh, into modern medicine. I also want to point out, in fact, that almost all the work that I presented here was done by surgical fellows uh, who come to the NCI for two or three year fellowships uh, and, work in our, uh, and work in our laboratories. So the work that I've presented, much of which, much of the, the last 10 minutes or so of the talk have not been published yet, but have been submitted for publication, indicate that by attacking mutations, we have the possibility of treating virtually any cancer type that has mutations, which includes almost all cancers, but they're treatment is gonna to have to be absolutely unique to the mutations in that particular patient's cancer. It's remarkable how few common mutations like KRAS and P53 exist. Anything other than those two <clears throat> types of mutations occur in low single digits among patients. And so it's going to have to be a highly personalized treatment in which a patient's own cancer uh, undergo undergoes a whole exome sequencing uh, that can actually be done in seven or eight days. We do it all in my own lab. The bioinformatics takes another couple of days. And so within 10 or 14 days, you have available all the mutations that exist in an individual cancer and can develop uh, the reagents to specifically attack them. It's going to be a daunting task. And this treatment, of course, is now only available as an experimental therapy here at the NCI and several other institutions around the world that are beginning to take up this uh, form of adoptive cell therapy. But when I began this cell therapy work in uh, the treatment of lymphomas a few years ago, uh, I also uh, heard that in fact, it would be too difficult to administer and yet now it's uh, available around the world uh, because of the need for it. And I have every confidence that if we can improve this treatment 
and get reproducible, uh, durable regressions in cancer patients that the genius of modern industry will figure out ways to develop it. So right now it's not widely available, but the principles that we're learning uh, are going to uh, help develop future immunotherapies, hopefully that will be uh, more effective uh, in the use of cells, the creation of a unique living drug for each patient. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, uh, Dr. Andy Lowy from UCSD. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, that was so inspiring. Uh, I, I wonder, in, in, in most of the publications, the, uh, the images that are shown are patients who have visceral uh, solid organ metastasis. And I, and I was wondering about the treatment of patients who have peritoneal metastasis and the, the penetration of the T cells into that environment and, and what your experience has been. When we inject these anti-tumor T cells, either naturally uh, existing or ones that we've created in the laboratory by putting in T cell receptors, they circulate, of course. Uh, and as you know, every 15 seconds or so, the heart's pumping out blood that's getting to these different organs. These cells will uh, be available to any tissue that has a vasculature. And that, of course, does include peritoneal metastases. And the one patient that we treated uh, with demonstrated intraperitoneal uh, metastatic disease did undergo a complete regression. So one of the beauties, of course, is of, of systemic treatment is that it does reach all vascularized tissues. And I think intraperitoneal metastases could be, uh, would certainly be eligible far better to administer systemically uh, in the circulation rather than in the peritoneal cavity itself where its distribution can be quite limited. Yes, please. Dr. Rosenberg, Joel Bean from Columbus. Um, again, great talk. It's always fun to see where you're gonna take this next and those tumor responses never get old seeing those pictures. Um, just one question, are, are we any closer to figuring out uh, and predicting who's gonna respond once we have the till prior to giving them to the patient? Are there any biomarkers that we're looking at and, and kind of what active areas of investigation are underway in that regard? So Joel, it's great to hear from you. Another one of our former, uh, former fellows. Uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to hear from you. We are trying to understand the nature of the cells that can mediate the tumor regression. What are their properties? What genes do they need to express? What are their functions? Are they, is it lysis? Is it attracting other cells to the site? We published a paper by one of our fellows, uh, Sri Krishna, uh, that was published in Science about four months ago that defined the stem-like properties of cells within the infusion that appear to be responsible for anti-tumor effects. And so in patients with melanoma, where we get response rates uh, of about 50%, we had uh, cohorts of patients that responded, did not respond. We could study using a uh, single cell uh, analysis the properties of cells in patients that did undergo regression could identify two genes in those cells, CD39, CD69, that were highly associated with the ability of those cells to cause cancer regression. And so that has led us now to try to isolate cells with those properties, stem-like properties, uh, that we can isolate uh, for treatment or use uh, as targets for the insertion of T-cell receptors with the uh, at least hypothesis that those cells will be more effective than putting the receptors into no, all normal circulating uh, lymphocytes. I think we could ask you questions all day, but we'll take the last two questions. Many people would love to spend the whole day uh, asking you questions, but we'll take Dr. Shisher Maitel from- I can go first. Sorry? You can go first. All right, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, my name is Hal. I'm a surgical resident from Pittsburgh. Um, the question that I have is that uh, for specifically uh, hepatic uh, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, the tumor microenvironment is highly immunosuppressive. I was wondering, um, so uh, the fact that uh, there are cells uh, that in the tumor that has the same mutation kind of like speaks to the fact that those cells are not functioning in the tumor. And I think uh, the adaptive cell transfer uh, solves uh, the problem of quantity uh, of this tumor cells. Uh, but I was wondering whether there's any uh, pairing, me uh, pairing uh, methods to actually overcome the uh, immunosuppressive uh, tumor microenvironment. 
thank you for raising that very important point. And it points to one of the advantages of adoptive cell therapy, because we can take, we take the cells out of the body, manipulate them, grow them, and then return them. That gives us an interval in which we can treat the patient. And all of these patients receive a lymphodepleting chemotherapy that uh, can eliminate lymphocytes temporarily for about uh, eight days before they naturally, uh, they naturally recover. Uh, we use cyclophosphamide as well as fludarabine. Now that eliminates regulatory T cells. It eliminates myeloid-derived suppressor cells and other cells that can inhibit immune reactions that are capable in the microenvironment of inhibiting the ability of the cells to actually mediate uh, tumor destruction. Uh, one can also potentially, and other people are working on this, introducing new genes into cells that we use for transfer, such as uh, uh, TGF-beta dominant negative cells that will enable cells to resist the negative impact of uh, transforming growth factor beta. So overcoming the microenvironment is a very important part of the effectiveness of this treatment, because as you point out, all of the lymphocytes that we use for treatment come from tumors that are growing despite those lymphocytes, uh, that lymph those lymphocyte presence within the tumor, uh, within the tumor itself. It's this altering the microenvironment that makes other systemic treatments difficult because very often in altering the microenvironment, you're impacting on the naturally occurring cells uh, that one counts on for uh, anti-tumor responses. Dr. Mythel from Emory. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, thank you very much. It's just an absolute honor to hear you speak and I'm not smart enough to ask a smart question, uh, but uh, I did get her permission before saying this, but I thought you'd be very proud and happy to know that patient number one MB that you showed up there is in the audience listening to you today. Um, and I think that, you know, just to illustrate, I think there's a lot of people here in the audience who don't know that. And I think it really illustrates the genius of what you've done and the impact of it. And um, I don't know if I'm, I, Melinda's okay being embarrassed because she's done this internationally. So Melinda's going to stand up. And, uh, you know, this is what... Um, this, this, I, I, I've been honored to see, watch this relationship over the years that I've known Melinda. And I just, I just think it's, it's an amazing thing that you've shown and, and thank you for everything you've progressed and, and to the audience. This is what Dr. Rosenberg work, work uh, looks like live 10 years later. Well, Melinda, I'm delighted you're, uh, you're there. We see each other uh, frequently. Melinda has become one of the great advocates for uh, funding for immunotherapy. Uh, around the country, and I'm delighted that she's uh, able to join you this morning. Well, I'm actually emotional on that last uh, note. It makes it even more special. We can't thank you enough, Dr. Rosenberg, for joining us, especially under these circumstances. We're thankful for Melinda and for all the patients that your work has helped. You've inspired all of us in this room today. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's my pleasure.